Okay, so here's the Black Death, 1356. Here's 1440. Clearly the initiation of a very steep symmetry break, a steep descent into novelty. What happened in 1440? Johannes Gutenberg printed the first Bible at Mainz near Frankfurt in Germany. Printing was invented. A technological and informational revolution like nothing the world had ever seen on a scale with the invention of the alphabet or perhaps the invention of language itself. But that ain't all. Fifteen years later, in 1455, just as we go over the lip of this thing, the Ottoman Turks seize Constantinople and chop off all European access to the markets of the Far East. This is a total body blow to the evolution of the European economies, and a group of previously obscure northern Italian cities decide to pool their money and take a chance on some new shipbuilding and navigation techniques and decide that they will attempt to sail around Africa to avoid dealing with the blockage of passage to the east by the Turks' seizure of Constantinople. These are the Renaissance, these people become the Renaissance princes because these previously poor Italian villages, Siena, Florence, Padua, Cordova, Civitella, they become the jewels of the Italian Renaissance. This is the Italian Renaissance, this incredible plunge into novelty. Everybody you ever heard of in the Italian Renaissance is on that gradient. You know, the early guys up here, Fra Angelico, um, uh, and like that, Donatello, Caravaggio, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo, um, Botticelli, the whole bit, and, and while all this art is being made, don't forget all kinds of invention is taking place as well. Uh, and it, the whole thing reaches its culmination at the bottom of this trough, 1492. Okay, now 1492 has been called the Año Mirabiles since it happened, the year of miracles. Because it was in a single year, the, the Muslims were expelled from Spain, and these voyages of exploration were undertaken that led to the discovery of the New World. Unlike the Black Plague, where the rebound was quick, there was no rebounding from the novelty unleashed by the Italian Renaissance and the discovery of the New World. Instead, there's a long, long period in which that novelty has to be assimilated. And, and this is like uh, the, the age of the marvelous. This is the age of the cult of the court of Rudolf in Prague. This is a, a period of time which stretches from 1492 to 1619. The entirety of the 16th century is along the bottom of this trough. And if you know anything about European history, you know that the 16th century was the most exotic century of the last 500 years before the 20th. I mean, this is where alchemy reached its great inflorescence. The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, the careers of Dr. D, of um, uh, Cornelius, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, um, the Ren uh, John uh, Giordano Bruno, all of that is happening here including the discovery of the new world. Well then, something happens here, and this whole thing abruptly comes to an end. There is an end to the era of novelty in 1619. Well, what happened in 1619? Uh, right, I know, you haven't a clue. <clears throat> in 1619, the Thirty Years' War began. The Thirty Years' War created modern Europe. When the Thirty Years' War begins, Europe is thoroughly medieval, ruled by popes and kings. At the end of the Thirty Years' War, Europe is a continent of nations, ruled by parliaments and councils. Uh, here it is, you know, warfare, destroying the novelty achieved here, but with major exceptions. I call this Newton's Notch. Uh, 
that's that's the founding of the Royal Society in England, Newton's Principia, Cartesian logic, uh, so forth and so on. It all is, uh, and you know, the the English Civil War is here, the Restoration, so forth. Wars of religion. Then, in 1740, it changes. This steep descent into novelty from roughly 1740 to 1845 is in its early phase what's called the European Enlightenment, the French encyclopedists, Voltaire, all that, and in its later phase what's called the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the American Revolution, 1776, right here, the French Revolution follows, 1789 right here, the restoration of Louis Napoleon, so forth and so on, and then this bump here is simultaneously the Franco-Prussian War in European history and the American Civil War in American history. So, yeah? Um, I would advise a lot of people would include along with the Italian Renaissance and the Greek Golden Age the birth of Christ as one of those points where the graph should do something. Um, and I noticed we skipped over that. I'd just be curious to see what it looked like in zero. Okay, well, we can go back to it. You're quite right. The, the life of Christ is very interesting because, of course, Christ is Christ. But he lived simultaneously uh, during the reign of one of the greatest civil and military reformers of all time. I mean, Christ lived in the era of Augustinian Rome. So uh, uh, it, it's a tremendous era of novelty. I can tell you what's going on. Remember how I said that Minoan Crete, it starts a cascade, and then that cascade doesn't flatten out until the fall of Rome. So it's in a very steep period of descent into novelty. Uh, after I go through this, I'll go back and pick it up for you if there's time. Uh, what I want to do is I want to fly toward modernity here. Uh, and here, I'll do it fairly quickly. Um, yes. This is a very uh, Eurocentric uh, viewpoint. If, would you get the same time, timeline, for instance, with uh, an Eastern uh, culture, like the Chinese culture? Well, two things to that. Uh, number one, you're right, and I'll come back to that. Number two, Oriental history shows a curious parallelism with Western history. In other words, the great, uh, uh, the, the Roman Empire rises and falls almost in perfect concert with the Han Dynasty. So, you know, in the, you can say it's Eurocentric, although uh, the Islamic role is strongly accentuated. I agree that it's Eurocentric. What kind of world are you living in? A Eurocentric world. The Maya, for all their accomplishments, don't deserve a blip of great depth in a universal novelty description like this, because who did they influence? But for instance, the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese inventions were transferred to Europe. Oh, yeah, well, that kind of thing shows up very well. Yeah, global evolution of technology, it picks up very well. Terence. Yeah. Who did the Mayans influence? No one. No one. Because there was no, I mean, the Toltecs a little, but who did they influence? Who? The Toltecs, you know, in the Valley of Mexico. Um, Terence, you know the other residents that they have there uh, on the... That, for example, 1313 is, you mentioned the collapse of, and retaking of the Holy Land by the Arabs and what have you. You also have at that point uh, the collapse and diaspora of the Templars who gave rise to the whole age of chivalry and, uh, you know, the, the troubadour uh, and all of that. The, the spreading through of medieval Europe uh, of those esoteric ideas gained in the Holy Land during that same period of time. That's right, the Angevine court of Eleanor of Aquitaine and that whole business. Okay, now let's zoom in on modern history. 
and, and finer scale stuff, because I want to show you, it doesn't only work on things on a scale of a thousand years. <clears throat> okay, there's 715 years on the screen, 357 years on the screen, 178, 89 years. Let's look here for just a moment. This is from 1906 to 1996. Uh, this is a good place to show you how the resonances work. Remember how I talked about Ur, Chaldea, Babylon, and then Egypt at the bottom of the trough of history's fractal mountain? Well, what's at the bottom of that trough here? 1933. What? Well, WPA, I hadn't thought of that. Large-scale building projects. <laughs> WPA. How about this? Uh, a cult, a cult of a godlike leader. Uh, a fascination with overscale architecture. A tendency to mistreat Jews. What have we got here? We've got Nazi Germany. The word Führer and the word Pharaoh are actually etymologically related. The, the static, monolithic, slave labor style of ancient Egypt is recreated inside the Third Reich. Is that not weird, I ask you? Uh, okay, so this is the early 20th century relativity, this descent into novelty. Relativity, 1906. Quantum, uh, Dada, 1919. Uh, Surrealism, the Manifesto, 1922. The Copenhagen Conference on uh, Quantum Physics, uh, 1923. Uh, the, you know, radio, all of it, powered flight, blah, 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 blah. World War, uh, the Third Reich. Then World War II fought across <laughs> the bottom of this trough here, ending in the explosion of the atom bombs. Now, after World War II, what people were interested in was literally a return to normalcy. It was called that, the return to normalcy. You know, we've whipped Hitler, we've called down the power of the stars upon our enemies, now we just want to go back and marry the girl next door and barbecue and <laughs> buy some tube furniture and get a Chevy and make nice make nice. <laughs> and here it is, you know, a, a period of traditional activity, recidivism, conservatism, so forth and so on. And now I'll uh, zoom in a little more. Uh, oh, before I do, uh, the whole 19, the early 1960s here, and then right here, right at the top, no, landing on the moon, landing on the moon, the hippies, LSD, the whole ball of wax. I mean, basically, at the very, very top of this thing, to the day, to the day, the human being in the panhandle in San Francisco. Now, if that doesn't confirm my own <laughs> inner agenda, uh, I don't know what possibly could. Uh, here, let's go in and have a look at it. Where's the Grand Central Station be? Oh, we'll get there. 44 years, there's the top of the 60s. 22 years, the Reagan-Bush era. 11 years. 11 years and two months. The last 11 years. Now, remind yourself, we have not moved the positioning. We have started with 6 billion years. We're down to 11 years. Everything is being generated from this point in 2012. It's been right, 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 right. And now, the last 11 years, from 83 to 94. Okay. Um, this is, uh, in resonance, the fall of Rome. In fact, the end of the Reagan era. Uh, this point here... Well, I'm going to go in one more scale, because I want you to see this. Because we've been through a lot 
in the past five years, seven months, and one day, I believe. <laughs> By the way, this, see this little pointer that has appeared? It's pointing at today. It's pointing at today. Okay. Let's go through these low points. This one, June 89, Tiananmen Square massacre, three million people, perhaps the largest crowd in history, halt in its tracks, the largest and most totalitarian government on the planet for 30 days is paralyzed until it uh, discovers a traditional solution to the problem mass murder of its own citizens. Okay, uh, go forward. Next low spot, November uh, 19, uh, let's see, yeah, yeah, November 1989, the Berlin Wall falls to the day, to the day, right there, the, the novelty trunk. Okay, now, this spot is interesting. This spot the bottom of this little trough here, on the next higher level, is the birth of Muhammad. The exact resonance date here of the birth of Muhammad is uh, August 3rd, 1990. Saddam Hussein seizes Kuwait on the day of the resonance of Muhammad's birth. So the and and, and Muhammad died. Did he know that? Over here. No, no. <laughs> they never know. <laughs> uh, Mohammed died here. So here's the seizure of Kuwait. Then remember the, all the breast beating and the moving of troops around and all that. That goes on up to here. Then this is the issuing of the UN ultimatum, which made war inevitable. Here is the air war, this descent here, early January 1991. The ground war, and if I were to blow up the bottom of this slope for you, you'd see that it's wildly fluctuating on the fine scale. But the land war is there. Okay. Next low point. August 1991. The, the kidnapping of Gorbachev and the first Soviet coup d'etat right there. I'm going to skip over this one because... Uh, the only interesting thing that happened there was that uh, it's the two interesting things happened, actually. Yeah. Food of the Gods was released mm. that day. <laughs> and I hate to tell you, but uh, Ross Perot went on Larry King and allowed us how maybe he would run for president. Uh, okay, then this low point here... Uh, Oh, wait a minute. Let me make sure I got my ducks in a row. Uh, let me use the pointer, actually. See, this tells me the exact date. Can you see that pointer? Kind of. How's the Mac <laughs> There's Clinton's election right there in that low trough. And as you see, then we have come up. We've, we've come up. Today, today, oh, oh, what was the date of the L.A. earthquake? January what? There it is. <laughs> That's January 13th. But you see the symmetry break. If I go one keystroke further, that's the 19th. So you see how tight on it is. Okay, so then today is... Um, February 27th. Now we'll fly in and have a look at it. No. <laughs> and that should tell you something. <laughs> just, just, just a sec, because I can't take my eyes off this thing. There's one year, there's eight months, there's four months, two months, one month, 15 days, seven days, 
the last seven days, the last three days, the last day, the last 23 hours. <laughs> I think we're getting close to the range limit. Let me, uh, let me do a couple of things here, a couple of housekeeping things. And uh, what I want to do is move today's date over to the other side of the screen so that we can look at the future. That's what's interesting now, because there's so little of it left. You see. We've been looking at six billion years. There's only 18 years left. I often wonder, so what if it were true? I'd hardly have time to enjoy my notoriety. <laughs> okay, now, uh, specify target date. C. <laughs> month. Month. Uh, oh, uh, two. 27, 1994, no, okay, now specify time span, uh, 20 years, E. From today? I think so, if I did it right. Years, 20, <coughs> plus months, no, plus days, no. Okay, now do we have everything right? <laughs> Graph the wave. Graph the wave. Yes. Oh. Okay, now see the pointer over here? That's pointing at today. Now remember how I said the impact on Jupiter was the week of, Jan of July 21? Let me run the pointer forward. There is August 5th, 1994, and the one stroke back, the 16th of July, 1994. See, it's right there. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this, other than just the razzle-dazzle of the future, is look what's coming. We've got a test of sufficient force coming that if the, if the wave fails this test, I wouldn't think it would be necessary to hang on until 2012 because this is a very major test of the theory and what it's saying is that beginning around January 23rd, 1996 and lasting until May 1st, 1996, a period of only 64 days, uh, there is going to be an enormous rush into novelty. And I have no idea what we're looking at. We could be looking at uh, revolution in China, AIDS cure, planetesimal impact, Hawaiian independence, or all of those and more. But it's that's where it'll be, early 96. Uh, the analog is the Umayyad Caliphate and the invention of algebra. So it may be that it's the evolution of some kind of incredibly powerful mathematical technique that will configure technology and science for the rest of the 18 years left to us. Now, I, I also wanted to show you this because this explains the, um, this compression that is going on in historical time Remember how I pointed out how the Nazis were very much like uh, Old Kingdom Egypt? Well, everything is being lived in these lower level resonances at high rates of acceleration and compression. So that, for example, uh, you know, what took 11 years in the past takes six days or something like that in the present. So fads and fashion are the place to look for the ebb and flow of this stuff. We right now are in the early 8th century, early 9th century. Uh, Clinton is our Charlemagne. 
Uh, the, the revolt in Mexico is in resonance with the Mayan collapse and going on in the very same area. This is how it works. It's a kind of a lens for seeing how the future unfolds along certain themes. So what I would predict here is uh, some radical gains or something radical here having to do with ideas and Islam. Maybe a young Palestinian physicist will write the unified field theory or something like that. Then uh, the rest of the 90s, where are we? Uh, 90, where, what's going on? Oh, 99. This is the rest of the 90s carries us only into the high Gothic period, the medieval period. Well, for sure, the fundamentalists are just going to camp on the millennium. I mean, they truly believe that Jesus is coming. So, uh, you know, this whole period around 2000 will be monopolized by Christian rhetoric and hoopla. Then, beyond that, uh, it looks like, you know, I would hate to think that this is some kind of new plague, but we do have in the early years of the next century the resonance with the Black Death. Further on, in uh, 2004 to 5, the Italian Renaissance in 2004, ending in late 2005 with the discovery of the New World, which I would predict is a water-heavy, oxygen-rich planet around Al of Alpha Centauri or Beta Centauri. You, I, just as an aside, did you know that Beta Centauri which, aside from the red dwarf Alpha Centauri, is the nearest star, Beta Centauri, is the most sun-like star within 70 light years of this planet. It's incredibly sun-like. 1.1 solar masses and burning in the same part of the spectrum as the sun it's entirely possible that in 2004 we will have sufficient uh, instrumentality that if there are planets around Beta Centauri, they will swim into view. And if they're water heavy and oxygen rich, we will have discovered the new world. Or it may be, you know, that somebody constructs a doorway into DMT land or something else. But, but 2004, the discovery of the new world, 2009, the equivalent of the Industrial Revolution, and then all of the 19th and 20th century compressed into the next two years, leading to the spin down. Because the shortest cycle is not 67 years, 104.25 days. The shortest, there are shorter cycles. There's a 384 day cycle that will begin 384 days before December 21st, 2012, and that into 384 days will pack all the resonances of all previous cycles. There will then be a six-day cycle at the end, packing all the resonances and associations into six days. There will then be an hour and 35-minute cycle then a 1.3 second cycle. And in other words, the thing is just hurtling toward the omega point. Imagine this. If you had a universe, like the kind of universe I'm describing, that was 72 billion years old, and that had 27 levels of spiral involution built into it with a collapse factor of 64, dig this, then half of its becoming would occur in the last six and a half hours of its existence. The universe would be only half completed six and a half hours before its final completion because the short epochs happen so rapidly. So this is what I think lies ahead. People, it's you know not permaculture, not not Hawaiian independence, not cheap beer, but something <laughs> so off the wall that the walls of, that the laws of space and time themselves are going to be melted, condensed, 
and rolled together. Uh, this is a process, I showed it to you. It's been rolling forward for 72 billion years. It's never arrived a moment late anywhere along the line. It's on time, it's under budget. And, and novelty, which we represent, which life represents, which civilization represents, novelty is the proof of it. And novelty is ingressing into three-dimensional space-time at precisely the rates that the theory predicts. It explains why we're here. It explains how the cosmic drama works. And it gives permission to drop anxiety because we're locked into an eternal process of alchemical rarefaction of novelty that is very close now to the culmination. The eschatonic body, the, the, the coincidentia oppositorum, the philosopher's stone, the UFO, the body and blood of our Lord, it's all about to be, to enter history. This is the persistent and, and incredibly irrational assurance of Western religion that what other people used to call God, that God would enter history. History is the shockwave of eschatology. The presence of history on this planet means that we are only geological microseconds away from the full revelation of the presence of the eschaton. It is causing history. History is a distorted perspective on a higher dimensional object that is pulling all process into itself and always has been. And, uh, you know, we barely have language for this. It's being revealed through the psychedelic experience. This is what shamans see. This is why I say a shaman is someone who has seen the end. Because you leave the radical, linear confinement of, of history and you rise up into the super space of eternity. You look left, you see the Big Bang. You look right, and you can see the entire set of universal processes being sucked into the transcendent present of the eschatonic object. Yeah. Could this possibly be the Earth wobble theory, where the ice caps in the North and South Pole become your new equator? I think it's more radical than that. I think it's the collapse of Newtonian space and time. I, don't, I think there's nothing left at all that you can hang a label on. That, that you know, you'll be neither Agnes nor Angus when this is over. Yeah. Is that progressing in the year 2022? 2012. 2022. Oh, no. See, what the, well, the way that if you were to buy the software, you can put any end date in just with the keystrokes. It comes with defaulted to the December 21, 2012 date okay. because, but, but let, let me, uh, uh, but you can enter any end date and then it will scale the entire wave for you relative to the end date you gave it. I scaled it to this date because after trying hundreds and hundreds of dates, this seemed to be right at all scales. This seems to work. Now, some, now, if you take this seriously and, and you try to make rational sense of this revelation, and it is a revelation, and dig the fact that it's a very strange revelation because it's absolutely self-limiting. I'm hung out to dry if nothing happens. Uh, it's a, it imposes its own test. It says, you know, we will deliver or you're free to reject it. So it isn't some vague promise about someday or soon or, no, dawn, Greenwich, 18 minutes after 11 a.m., December 21st, 2012, Greenwich, mean time, the eschaton will rise in the east and consume the solar system and so forth and so on. Um, now, what did I want to say about this? I can't remember. There was something. Go ahead. I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that you take the progression to the year 2022. You mean try that as an end date? Well, that's Not an end date. A now date. A progression date. Well, let me explain yeah. to you, like short of 
the absolute consummation of the world and the ascent into the angelic imperium, exactly. how could this be fulfilled? How could this be fulfilled and be true and yet somehow not leave no stone upon another? New war. New, new, war. new, new war. No, nuclear war is a recidivist return to happen. Here's the one thing that could happen, as I see it, that could fulfill the prophecy and yet leave three-dimensional space and time intact. One thing I've noticed about the wave is that it's excellent at predicting the evolution of technology. Technology and novelty are very closely related concepts in the cosmos of the time wave. How would it be if what happens at 18 minutes after 11 a.m. on December 22nd, 2012, is that a button is pushed, and for the first time in the history of this planet, a person moves through time. Mm -hmm. The sequential linearity of history ends, and then we would all say, of course, history ended. Because, and I, dis I discussed this with the mushroom, and it told me a very strange thing, which I didn't believe at the time. It said, time machines are possible, but you can only go back in time as far as the moment of the invention of the first time machine. Because before that, there were no time machines. And how can you take a time machine into a universe where, by definition, time machines do not exist? That would introduce a paradox. So then I thought about it, and I thought, and follow me through on this, I thought, aha, here's the picture. It's, it's a few moments before sunrise in the Amazon, December 21st, 2012 AD, at the World Temporal Institute, the first person is about to be sent into the future. The Lady Temponaut is strapped into the machine in full view of a worldwide three-dimensional virtual reality hookup. Everybody is watching. A, a brief speech is made, a countdown from 20, a button is pushed, and off she goes into the future. Now, the interesting question at this point, I think, is what happens, to use an obsolete word, next? <laughs> what happens next? And I think in that kind of a universe, what would happen next is that thousands, tens of thousands of time machines would begin arriving at the end of the time road. They would have come back to see the first trip into time. They would arrive from all points in the future at the end of the road to witness the first time travel. Now, now, I, I, this, this idea lasted for about 24 hours. And then I realized there's a problem here. There's something called the grandfather paradox that is always introduced in discussions about time travel, and it is this. If you were able to travel back in time, you could kill your grandfather. If you killed your grandfather, you would not exist. Therefore, you could not have traveled back in time and killed your grandfather. Therefore, we're hung out to dry here on some kind of a paradox. It, and the only way around that paradox, because you see in the kind of time travel the mushroom says is allowed, the traveling back to the moment of the first time machine's invention, you could still have a grandfather paradox. Because if your grandfather was born in 2022 and you were born in, in 2080, on your way back to 2012, you could stop in 2025 and kill your infant grandfather. So what do we do about this? The solution is this. When the button is pushed, when the Lady Temponon sails off into the future, what happens is not that time machines arrive instantly from all points in the future. Something much more radical happens. The rest of history 
happens instantaneously. It, it all happens instantaneously. There is a collapse of the illusion of linear time. I call this the God whistle. What you do is you sound this shrill tone and the rest of universal history is like magically removed and the next serial moment is the last moment in the history of the universe and you go into the highest state of evolution that the universe can achieve in its entire history. So what this is, is a, a kind of fast forward button. You think you're inventing time travel. What you're really inventing is a button which causes the rest of time to happen instantly and then the entire global civilization moves into eternity. Uh, it's a curious thing, but hey, what isn't? <laughs> yeah. How do you relate this to apocalyptic theory, to uh, second coming, to... Excellent question. <laughs> Here's how I relate it to it. Through the resonances that we've been looking at here, it's clear that if time is this kind of fractal that I'm talking about, then it's a series of embedded modules that are complete within themselves. Mm -hmm. So that the entire history of the universe is in some sense recapitulated in every minute, every hour, every day, every year, every century is a recapitulation or an anticipation of the highest cycle of time. So uh, a Christ, a Buddha, a Mohammed is simply a person who stood in a certain geometric relationship to the object at the end of time. You know how you can stand on a hill and the glass windows of a house across the valley will be blinding, but if you move just a few feet, it, it disappears into the general environment. These are people who are, were as ordinary as you and me, except for their perspective on the eschaton. And these were the biggies, Christ, Buddha, Mohammed, every single one of us from, you know, Joe Shako Guru to you and me, we all have a perspective on the eschaton. It's within us. Genetic and coding. Genetic encoding. Anticipation. So, so uh, everything that, so the promise of Western, well, here's the way to think of it. Think of the eschaton, this object in eternity, pulling everything toward itself. Think of it as one of those mirrored, uh, balls that they hang in discos and spin, you know? And you know how it causes moving lights on the walls? Those are reflections of the bar ball, but they're distorted reflections. And all reflections are distorted. So David Koresh's version of things, Charles Manson's version, Buddha's version, Hitler's version, Christ's version, everybody's version is slightly or more than slightly tweaked, <laughs> including mine, of course. All versions are tweaked, but the closer you get to the end of the road, the less tweaked the versions are because the radiance of the thing is growing in power. So a shaman 50,000 years ago in his cave in the south of France taking mushrooms, he looks forward and there's a dim glimmering, a something, a transcendental hope, a possibility. Now you take mushrooms and you can almost see the radiance of the eschaton shining through uh, ordinary reality. And all these religions are anticipations of this thing. And your own transcendent hopes are an anticipation of this thing. We can tune in to the eschaton. And this is what psychedelics are. That's why I said a shaman is someone who has seen the end. A shaman is someone who knows how the story comes out and can therefore return to ordinary linear time 
take their place in the drama with a total absence of anxiety and then be a wonderful role model, curer, and paradigm uh, for other people who lack this critical piece of knowledge, the nature of the end. Yeah. Would it be your suggestion that uh, at 11 a.m. on December 21st and 2012 to be heavily dosed? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's like raising a lighted match to greet a supernova. <laughs> yes. It seems to me that the, the basic paradox between traditional scientific thought and what Rupert is talking about, you're talking about, Abrams is talking about, um, the people in quantum physics, uh, Gotswami and those guys, is revolves around the issue of teleology and the rejection of teleology and this causes the absolute collapse of that uh, denial that something in the future can influence and cause an event in the past and that is the philosophical peg around which all of this is working that's right let me explain what's being said here teleology is a fancy philosophical word for purpose if you have a telos, you have a purpose. And it has been very, very important to modern science to remove teleology from its explanations. Even the theory of evolution, which is the most teleological of scientific theories, real hardcore evolution, materialist evolutionists will tell you, don't think of it as progress. It's not progress. It's random mutation being acted upon by selective forces in the environment. But don't think that an elk is more advanced than an amoeba, or that a gray whale is more advanced than a sponge. There is no progress here. There is simply sideways mutation toward different form. But I say this contravenes reason. There obviously is progress, but progress means movement toward a goal. That's a purpose. That movement toward a goal is a purpose, and they go berserk when you try to inject teleology. It undermines the causation. That's the right. Basic That's right. Of modern science. Yes, you see, 19th century science arose in an atmosphere of what was called deism. Deism was the current form of Christian theology that said that the universe was a kind of universal machine that God had built and set running and then gone away and left. And the 19th century the Darwinists and the Wallaces, they wanted to get away from teleology. So they built logical systems where everything proceeds from cause to effect. Everything is pushed from the past toward the future. I'm saying exactly the opposite. Using the new language of chaos theory and dynamics, I'm saying the future contains an attractor, a kind of energy uh, low point in the topology, and, and history is like releasing a ball bearing on a stretched rubber sheet that has a low point. Where will the ball bearing roll? Where will it end up? in the low point, and it may even circle around the low point as it rattles down into the bottom like a, like a pinball in a pinball machine. This is perfectly reasonable. It's just incredibly unwelcome in the domain of science, but I think that science has betrayed itself by not admitting that over all scales of time and all scales of phenomena, novelty is being conserved, is refining, building upon itself, and accelerating its approach toward an ideal state of perfection, and that is this eschatonic body. Yeah. But you said that science is betraying it doesn't want to, but the 264 is also found as a, a major number in computers, technology, which is a culmination of science and also genetic code, DNA. It's, it's all interlinked together. So once science recognizes that, they, if they're going to come to the realization that, that they were wrong. 
Yeah, the problem is, as I said at the beginning of today, that science as we know it will not survive this revolution because time is a variable and all science that has been done to date has treated time as an invariant. And if we want to understand love affairs, revolutions, corporate takeovers, uh, brain tumors, the, if we want to understand the things that matter to us as organisms, we're going to have to create an entirely new definition of, of what science is about and what it's looking at. Yeah. Um, everything you measure is altered by the act of measuring. That's right. So therefore, if, if it were a giant flywheel, everything spinning, everything repeating, um, that's the site. Um, what people perceive is that the, there's, a, as well as that perfect repetition, there's, the, there's this light vibration of the machine. And that's what most people perceive, and that's what they are, a slight and irrelevant imperfection in the cycle of infinite recurrence. And that is the resonance and analog on the quantum physics level Correct. of spirit being the motivating factor for matter rather than the reverse, as in your discussions of teleology and the cause, causation-driven theories. You see where That's I'm right. That's yeah. why... Yeah. There are 64 species of time. That's why DNA is the way it is. DNA is like iron filings arranging themselves in the presence of a deeper magnetic ordering field, the principle of 64. That, the 64 hexagrams are mental categories, iron filings on a different level, but all configuring themselves to reflect these universal principles of hierarchical ordering and interrelatedness. Now, I, I, to, in a de, to a degree, it's an indulgence on my part to tell you all this because it's just my theory, or that's how a straight person would see it. From my point of view, this is what the mushroom said. From the mushroom's point of view, this is square one. This is what you know if you know anything. This is what you know if you've ever been off the block. Of course you know the nature of space, time, matter, and energy. Yeah. Um, as the master of astronomer can explain it to me that in the beginning of, of the creation of the universe, everything passed through a single point. And what I'm beginning to hear from you is it's almost like you've seen creation backwards, where we're coming to the beginning of time, going through the central point. So it's actually coming to tell us the Yes, the scientific theory is called the Big Bang. The theory I've put out this morning, I would call the Big Surprise. And uh, the Big Surprise comes at the end, and not at the beginning, yeah. Well, what I'm seeing is that there, is no, there really is no beginning or ending. What you're saying is it, where, we're head, where we're going is to the eye of the form, the eye. We're going outside the cycle of cause and effect. Exactly. To, to the yeah. And the thing is, haven't you all noticed that people being amenity to muscaria, magic light, and psilocybin, psilocybin is spoken of on a massive scale, is exactly coincided with the advent of ecological concern? Now, there's a tale your biology teachers never told you. That the, the rise of ecological concern and the awareness of plant consciousness through psychedelics are are simultaneous phenomena. I mean, essentially, the Gaian mind is coming into focus. History is ending. The, the evidence of your senses is true. It can't go on much longer. It can't go on much longer. What you thought you saw was real. Right. And there is built into the physics of this universe, local or general, who knows, this bootstrapping circularity that is going to lift us to higher and higher levels. Now, what I want to say about this as we're getting close to the end, sorry, is uh, you, you should not believe this. I don't believe this. I got as far as I got by not believing anything. The mushroom specifically said, when I said, why are you telling me this? It said, because you don't believe anything. Uh, this is a hypothesis to be tested. It is not a religious faith to kneel down in front of. It is mathematically anchored 
as modern theories have been since the 1850s, and it can be tested and possibly overthrown by ordinary methods of discourse and analysis. It is not a mystical teaching. It does not depend on belief. It's a series of interlocking mathematical assertions that uh, are open to test. And I cannot imagine what the purpose of my 25-year-long involvement with this is unless there is some measure of truth in this. I have studied other channelings from the Urantia book through whatever, and it isn't like this. Nobody gets it down to a mathematical algorithm that can be submitted to the desk of science for a visa stamp. Uh, this is coming from the same place where uh, those things not based on faith but on the deeper implications of reason and mathematics are coming from, we do feel our planet to be in crisis. A, a, an odd thing about this theory, which I confess troubles me, as I guess the way to put it, is that it, it seems to lift obligation off of us. It seems to be saying it's here. There is nothing left to be done. And, you know, I come out of the Berkeley Commune, a tradition of political activism, a real uncomfortableness with uh, bad social policy and the repression of, of unfortunate classes, races, and people. And I want to do something. I'm puzzled by the completedness of this theory. And where I rest with it is I act as though it is not true. And I think you should act as though it is not true. You're still responsible. You can't be a jerk. You must still recycle. You must still take care of your shit. But this is permission to hope. This is permission to understand how your dreams could come true. It isn't that the flying saucers will come or that Lemuria will rise from the sea, or that Maitreya will descend in a cloud of light. It's that the laws of physics and nature themselves have been designed to save you from what you probably deserve. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a psychedelic revelation that touches every aspect of human life. It's a way of looking at things novelty and habit. It's, it's a scientific, quote unquote, argument for not pushing the river. It's a kind of mathematical description of the Tao. I mean, if you think about the Tao Te Ching, the primary text of Taoism, in the Whaley translation, it opens like this. The way that can be told of is not an unvarying way. Now, despite the clumsy use of the double negative, not an unvarying way, what that sentence says is the way that can be told of is a varying way, a varying way. And that's what we have here. We have the universal ebb and flow of flux. The One of the greatest philosophers in the Western tradition, the pre-Socratic Heraclitus, got it down to an aphorism in Greek. He said, Pantit rea, all flows, all flows. This is the truth. Dominator psychology wishes to build stability where no stability can be permitted in the construction of calendars, in the construction of ideologies, in the construction of relationships. This is a perversion of circumstance. Everything is in flux. Everything flows. Everything in its time is replaced by something else. This is a universal truth, and it can liberate, and it can make the felt presence of immediate experience rich, satisfying, 
It can, in short, give life meaning. And we are so embedded in the linear, causal, Newtonian, materialist, reductionist, dominator paradigm that the only way to climb out of that cellar and reach out for the, uh, the light and the spirit that this universal flux represents is to do it with psychedelics. Our religions are, are, are too freighted with past error, philosophical and political. The only way to do it is to directly address your own psychosomatic experience of being by stepping outside of history and going back to the plants. The plants stand outside of history. They stand in the domain of biology, and they will liberate us. You and me and everybody not here and every thing in space and time. We are moving toward the revelation of the universal purpose that has been in the process of defining and revealing itself since the first atoms clattered into existence. We're part of that drama and we can join in that drama if we avail ourselves of these plant allies and make nature into a partner instead of an obstacle or an enemy. And that's all I have to say about this. Thank you very much.